Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On this week's episode, we welcome USA Today sports journalist Josh Peter. And Josh and I first talked to each other back in November of 2022 when he reached out to me to learn more information on Kanye West's Donda Academy. And we kind of struck up a friendship from that. And I wanted to get him on the podcast so we could talk about, you know, what it's like to become uh, or how to become a sports journalist what his trajectory was, some of the top stories he worked on. Um, he talks about Donda Academy, some of his top articles of all time, and it just it's a great insight into the world of sports journalism. We talk about Donda Academy in more detail um, and what could have become of that. We talk about some of his dream events that he would like to cover, that he's seen, and much, much more. So without further ado, please enjoy this podcast with USA Today's Josh Peter. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Corey. Great to be here. Yeah, appreciate you inviting um, me. Yeah, appreciate you uh, coming on. Um, you're a sports journalist for USA Today. Um, I know it started way before then, but how did you get into sports journalism, and what was the initial seed that was planted that made you want to do this? Um, you know what? I love sports, and then about uh, I guess it was middle school. I discovered I really love to read about sports more than actually participate in sports. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, reading the LA Times, and it was one of the best sports sections in the country. And I literally read it as I was walking to school. So, you know, a little surprising I didn't get picked off by a bus or a truck or something like that. But, um, you know, that was really how I learned to do it was, was read the, uh, read the paper, read the sports section. And um, I mean, it's a combination. Obviously I love sports and, and uh, the suspense of a great contest, but it was really uh, the opportunity to capture it and uh, write about the people who are playing the games. I mean, that, just fascinated me more than the possible. You know, also, I the chance of making the Dodgers sort of seem like it was dimming. So um, my professional prospects were a little bit more promising headed to sports writing rather than participating in sports. <laughs> right. And growing up and reading the Times, like what was your main team? Um, Dodgers, Lakers, Rams, Kings. You know, I followed them all. UCLA, really not a USC fan. Sorry, mm -hmm. USC. Um, but there were such great sports here in Los Angeles. And, you know, people make fun of sports fans that were leaving Dodger games in the seventh inning. And uh, that's not totally untrue. Um, but, you know, some great teams. I mean, growing up with, uh, you know, Dodgers infield and Showtime and, you know, spectacular stuff. So I was lucky in that, in that um, situation as well. What was the topic of the first published article you ever had? Do you remember? Yeah, I do. Um, I wrote a story about Lyle Alzado. He had uh, moved into my neighborhood and um, I was interested in getting started. So I knocked on his door and I asked for an interview and um, it was about Lyle coming to the neighborhood. And uh, yeah, it was, he was, it was an interesting interview. He was walking around his kitchen, his, his dining room. I was asking him questions, a little unorthodox, um, but I was really grateful that he, he allowed me to come inside his house and ask him questions. I mean, probably didn't probably didn't grant a lot of interviews to high school uh, aspiring um, sports writers, and uh, got it published by the local newspaper. And within, I'd say, weeks, I had a job at the local newspaper. So you know, wow, well, it was actually played a formative role in getting me started. He never knew, but it was just kind of cool that some athletes would make themselves available. You know, some would never even open the door, but I'm really grateful. I, I appreciate you asking that question. I mean, I really reflect on how I got started and that the guy actually opened his door, allowed me in, wasn't totally focused or present, but hey, I got what I got and made it work. Like, can you tell and people, people that- for people who don't know, of course, was the great football player for the, uh, the Oakland Raiders. And I think he played briefly for the Denver Broncos um, and later acknowledged that he used- uh, steroids and thought that it led to health complications that ultimately resulted in his demise but i'm um, really colorful guy so that's how i got, got started a lot, 
Lyle's poster was up in our health class in uh, the late eighties in junior <laughs> high talking about the dangers of steroids. Yeah. So, Oh really? Yes. Oh, interesting. Yes. Yeah. And did I he mean, act as well, yeah. Josh? Uh, I'm not sure that he might have, I wouldn't be surprised when he had such a larger than life persona. I mean, be easy to cast him in a, in a film, but um, don't know about that. Maybe I need to write the uh, the follow up story. <laughs> All these years later, huh? So you're <laughs> you're at USA Today now, and uh, it was a big big path to get there because that's that's a that's a you know big distribution with that newspaper. It's in every state; everyone can get on their doorstep pretty easily versus a local paper. Um, what was your path to go from that first article on Lyle to actually getting to USA Today? And was there one thing that kind of took you over that edge to get to that level? Um, yeah, good question. I'm thinking about this. Well, you know, out of high school, I ended up going to Northwestern uh, University and majored in journalism, and they had one of the top programs in the country, so to, it, um, top schools in the country, so it allowed me to, to learn about the craft and, in the classroom, although what I discovered and what I was told was, you know, end up learning more in two months than you learn in four years at school. Uh, maybe not quite that drastic, but um, at school, I ended up writing for the, uh, the school newspaper and covering women's basketball and soccer and, and football. And the one thing I, I did, and I'd encourage people who are interested in journalism to do is, you know, it didn't seem like women's basketball was the most glamorous thing for me to cover. I hope that doesn't come across as inappropriate, just in terms of uh, following and so forth. Or that men's soccer, which was a club sport, was the most glamorous sport to cover. Um, but it was just the opportunity to get out there and learn uh, interviews and, and uh, you know, doing something on deadline. And it just didn't really matter if it was football or men's basketball or some of the sports that, that drew the bigger crowds. Um, so I just got started writing. And uh, when I graduated, I knew I was going to be working for the Washington Post, the New York Times, or the Los Angeles Times. And, uh, of course, they scoffed and they laughed at <laughs> the uh, – at the resume, I ended up working for a small paper in Anderson, South Carolina. And uh, of course, I rented furniture because I knew it was only going to be there for six months. And five years later, after I paid for the furniture five times over. Um, but what I loved about Anderson, I never would have understood before I got there was it was a chance to cover high schools in the South, which, you know, football, high school football in the South was unlike anything I'd ever known. And um, college football, which I really hadn't experienced, again, in the, in the South, it's so different. There's such fervor for it. And, um, you know, again, I'm just a chance to do a lot of stuff. And it took me longer to get out of there than I expected. But so it was Anderson, South Carolina, the Independent Mail. Um, from there, I went to uh, the state in Columbia, South Carolina, covered exclusively uh, Clemson University. Um, about a year later, went to the Memphis Commercial Appeal. And that... At that point, I got a job as what they call a takeout writer, which is longer profiles, um, enterprise stories. So they'd send you for a week or two or three at a time and really dig into a subject as opposed to cover the games and uh, you know, sort of the daily developments on a beat. So I went from beat writing to um, takeout writing and enterprise writing, spent only six months in Memphis and went to New Orleans, the Times Picayune, and was there for about between six and or between seven and eight years and again it was it was takeout room, but i did a lot of stuff mike dicka was down there did stuff mm -hmm. on dicka the nba ended up down there nba and louisiana is like such a rich state for story you got your fair share of scandal and, and everything else just such a colorful place so was grateful for that um hurricane trina katrina chased me out uh ended up Going to work next um, for Yahoo Sports. Took a little sabbatical from sports. Went and got my uh, master's of social work and was a therapist for about six months, or actually, I'm sorry, 18 months. And um, then caught on with USA Today uh, about eight years ago. Um, and again, in this role of enterprise writer, I don't cover games on a, on a regular basis, but um, as mentioned before we got on here, I covered the, uh, the College Football National Championship and I've done some bigger events and some really small events and um, appreciate them all the quirky and offbeat to you know your grand um 
sort of the tentpole uh, Olympics and uh, national championship, Super Bowl. So, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it all. So you get to a new spot like New Orleans where you don't know the players, you don't know the local guys that give you tips. How do you come up with your first longer story there? Is it something the editor gives you some ideas or you're just scouring the newspaper, just looking for something? Like, how do you get your leads in a town you know nothing about? Great question. I, I'm trying to think. I, I think you know, early on they gave me a couple assignments. And as I made calls, you start to develop sources. And also, I mean, just a steady, a steady diet of sources coming from your editor before you have a chance to develop sources and find your own stories i mean you know maybe it can come about by being in a bar and meeting someone there and talking about a story or someone you meet on a story talking about another story you know taking a random phone call in the sports department calling about and calling in with a crazy idea um and then really developing relationships with editors and developing story ideas too. I mean, some were mine and some were theirs and some were a collaboration. And oftentimes the, the collaboration was the best. This might start as this and well, mm -hmm. let's tweak a little bit now. It's that. Um, but I just think as you get out there and you meet people and talk to people, things just develop and how you find stories. Have you ever gotten a cold call email of just a great story that you had no idea was coming? Um. Does that sure happen? That does happen, right? It does. It does. Not common. It's not common. Um, you know what? Actually, it's usually in response to something I've written. Hmm. You know, write about your story, and I've got something um, even more compelling. Not always true, but or you know, I've heard about you, or a friend mentioned you, and so I've got this. Um, but it's often like, you find a kernel of something in someone else's story or you read about something and you're wondering about well, why that happened. Um, but it's oftentimes, yeah, news can, news can trigger a story about, um, you know, what were some of the underlying forces that led to that? Or, you know, is there a deeper story um, behind that, uh, that news event? Sometimes someone's death or someone's birth or, you know, divorce. I mean, you know, big events in people's lives and um, where that's left them, how they ended up there. Um, those are some of the things that come to mind. So you live in Los Angeles and, you know, I don't know when we're going to air this or when people are going to listen to this, but this Monday you covered the national championship game where Georgia just throttled TCU. So you've got media coming from all over the country and you have to figure out what angle you're going to take on your stories. So walk me through like, all right, in, a, in two months from now, I'm going to have the championship game in my hometown. How do you, when does your, when do your story ideas start? Is it you and your editor? How do you come up with something that's going to be original and different than all the other thousands of reporters that's going to be spending the week in LA kind of covering these two teams? Right. Well, this is not the ideal event to talk about in those terms because I was a late addition to the crew. <laughs> so it wasn't okay. didn't have a chance to plan. I've done that now with other events. I don't want to ignore this one, but a Super Bowl, um, this past Super Bowl um in Los Angeles, you know, we were talking about it weeks in advance. And uh, so there were some stories. Um, I ended up talking to Matthew Stafford's wife and was on that, was after the story for for weeks, actually months about quarterbacks wives and, and what they go through. So some of those um, more, I don't know, deeply reported stories do require more work. And I ended up getting her, and those like really satisfying stuff when you plan and, and you're able to execute a story. She was great, by the way. But this is sort of jumping into the last minute. So I was hamstrung a little bit. What did I do? I was outside in the rain trying to find people to talk about scrambling to, to the uh, stadium through the uh, unexpected uh, inclement weather in Los Angeles and uh, searching for celebrities at the game, it kind of came up empty. Um, I've done it before. I got uh, Kanye West and uh, an AB last year at the Super Bowl, but no luck this time. And then um, afterwards, I ended up writing about um, Stetson Bennett and his NFL prospects. And I'm talking about that. But guess what you find now is there's such wall-to-wall -wall coverage of these events 
you know, prints, video, broadcast, podcast. It's like by the next morning, this stuff is it's like, a, you know, you're wrapping fish in the newspaper. And um, it's almost like you need to advance the story a little bit. It's not like it was brilliant, but rather than write about what he had done, it's like, what's next? Um, people had seen what he'd done. People read about what he'd done. So, you know, the angle was um, some of the doubts he faced, you know, when it comes to his NFL prospects and uh, spinning it forward. So I don't know if that's helpful at all. Absolutely. Um, but in the past, if something extraordinary happened, I guess I would have written about it. But it's like, what might people be interested in the next day? Probably not reading a game story, although they're going to get a game story. Um, analysis they're going to enjoy. But, you know, what's next for some of the stars? Yeah, I love that. But you mentioned the Super Bowl last year. I mean, that's almost double the amount of media. That's double the amount of potential stories. Like, you got to pick one, hopefully, that no one else does too. So, to me, that would seem like like a lot of pressure to make sure you've got a unique take on that event. Right. Well, no one else had the Kelly Stafford story, and she's just about as uh, blunt and um, colorful a person as I've talked to her among the among what top ten or something like that. So she talked about like the strife she and Matthew Stafford, the Rams quarterback, had experienced during the season, relationship issues and problems. Like, just sort of like stunning what she was willing to open up about. So. You know, rarely had a peek into the life of a quarterback through his wife and um, some of the difficulties, because of marital difficulties it had during the season. So, you know, people are tend, tend to be so protective of their personal lives, and I get it. Right. But when you have a chance to talk to someone who's opening up about the wife of the star quarterback, opening up about this stuff. And, of course, she was also the, uh, the NFL wife who um, pelted a – 49ers fan with a soft pretzel when the guy wouldn't stop going after, uh, stop heckling her husband. So, you know, she's, we'll say fun. Instead and Josh. Of that could be construed as derogatory. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I think of too, like your training and experience as a therapist too, like you might have a better way to ask questions now, get stuff out of people than prior to having that experience. Am I right on that? I'm not sure of his experience as, as a therapist, but I think I can make people relatively comfortable when asking what could be sensitive questions. Or you know, my my hope, I'm not sure it always works. I am not the star at the press conference. You know, I'm not the one who's hands shooting up and can't wait to uh, stand up and in front of the cameras ask the questions. You know, if I need to, I will, but I'd much rather be involved in an interview that turns into a conversation. Um, and of course we have to ask questions, but sort of let it take its own path. And, um, I think in that case, people grow more comfortable and they just start opening up. So I think if you, there's nothing wrong with a set of questions to get started, but if it's a Q and a the whole time and never sort of evolves into just conversation, you're probably going to be limited in what you get. I don't know. That's my experience. I've seen some great Q and A's too, but I'd rather it turn into a conversation. Yeah. Makes sense. What's the worst part of your job? The worst part of my job. Well, deadline is not my favorite. I've broke, I've, I've busted many a deadline in my day. <laughs> Can I get, I'll have it in a half hour, which you say always means an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so deadlines sort of frightening. Uh, especially at night when you know, in the old days when the presses were about to run, you know, there was no room for air. They can't, they're not going to stop the presses for you. So it's a little bit more flexible now. I mean, you know, the internet's not going to tell you, sorry, it's too late to post your story. Um, and what else? Um, Conflict is not fun, but it can be really fruitful to talk to someone who doesn't want to talk to you. Um, you know, I've been like blasted um, at times, and that's not fun to get blasted, especially in front of other reporters. Um, but I guess people face that? that at work. 
you know, I'm trying to think of the name of the uh, the Braves had a relief pitcher back in 1990. I think his last name was Freeman. Oh, this is terrible. I can't think of his name. And um, boy, I was based. I was a Cub reporter, and I. Uh, I'm not sure how to describe it. I mean, I I, I took my uh, lumps that one in the clubhouse. When I think it was Mark Lemke, the second baseman, and I can't remember the shortstop, but they they tied a twenty dollar bill to the end of a fishing wire on a on a fishing on a fishing pole, and they told me, "Hey, hey, you dropped a twenty. I now I knew I didn't drop a twenty, but I also knew that I was supposed to participate in this prank. And so as I leaned over to pick up the twenty, you know, they reeled the uh, the fishing rod. The twenty went, you know, sailing. And so the guys are laughing, and I'm the butt of the joke. But it's okay. Like that was that was acceptable. A little embarrassing, but acceptable. God, this guy I can't think of his name. So I walked up to the relief pitcher, and he was busy at the locker room. But it's excuse me, and I'm Josh Peter with the Anderson Independent Mail, and he just exploded just exploded i'm not even sure what i'd allegedly done wrong i'm not sure what my misstep was but you know, sometimes people are in a bad mood so i bet it happens more in a locker room than it does in a boardroom maybe not i haven't spent mm -hmm. a lot of time in a boardroom but yeah those occasional situations which are tense because maybe someone's you know what after a loss um after a bad play call mismanaged you know two minute two minute Two minute drill, whatever, two minute offense. Um, you know, I don't know. Again, that's those are uncomfortable situations. I don't love those. No, I bet not. But was there any time you did an interview or walked up to someone were, were starstruck? Like, oh my gosh, I'm getting ready to talk to this person. Um like a childhood hero or anyone like that that you finally met as yeah, a reporter. A little bit. You know, I don't want to say starstruck, but Magic Johnson, you know, growing up and little, I mean he was larger than life. And um, maybe starstruck, but just, uh, um, I'd say an awe, but yeah, I was sort of taken aback. I mean, this is a guy who I'd considered a childhood hero, and I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And he was so gracious um, and uh, willing to talk and uh, so disarming. So it didn't last long, but you know, like Magic Johnson. Um, there are others like that too, but yeah, you know what? Another one, and again, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it. I think that I'd be past this, but it was just a phone interview with Michael Jordan. It took some, it took some work to, to get him on the line. And, um, I remember I had two recorders going because I don't want to blow this and not have, <laughs> you know, right. I rarely do that, but oh boy. Um, and so I was, yeah, uh, yeah, a little starstruck or just don't blow this don't blow it but mm -hmm. um someone else recently had that feeling and uh oh, i can't remember but yeah those are two that come to mind that and the uh the reliever will both come to you in the shower later today josh so <laughs> those names <laughs> Well, hey, we connected back in November, and uh, you reached out wanting to know a little bit more about Donda Academy, and uh, we chatted about that. Tell me what piqued your interest to even start looking into Donda, and tell tell people out there that don't know what's going on, um, what Donda was, why you started looking into them, and what ultimately what ultimately happened. Right. Um, well, of course, America's favorite rapper, um, Strutter's own basketball program and this um this is something that appealed to me back in um back almost a year ago and we're looking into the program and see whether or not they were they had the credentials to um uh to operate as a school and i could get nowhere i couldn't couldn't make any kind of contact and um you know, tried to get players and they were just sort of shut down and ultimately got a hold of a player who I'm, I should have done my research now, but those names, my names are escaping me today. Played as a B, plays at BYU, um, Brandon. And it was finally someone who was open to talk to me about this stuff. Um, and as the program began to fall apart, 
Um, that really spurred us. You know, we sort of really had no no more time to waste on it, and um, began to make calls and and just that's it. I mean, oftentimes in in this business, it's working the phones. And I went down there and I saw the facility where they were working and they were practicing and so forth. But um, working the phones, players, uh, parents, and trying to get a sense for for what had happened over the last couple of years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this podcast here, we talk a lot about brick and mortar prep schools, basketball academies, and one, one false move can shut down an academy. And usually it's financial, right? Well, finances weren't the problem here because obviously Kanye is a, a self-proclaimed billionaire, but his comments right in the press last November, um, they were anti-Semitic got Don the Academy banned from a lot of these big time events they were playing in. And then it seemed like overnight, everyone just kind of jumped ship to include the coach Darrell Wright, who actually went to a prep school. He went to South Kent. Um, all the other players kind of scattered and you were trying to figure out what these guys were going to do. And what did you find out in that process? Um, well, what I found out is I, I think they'd, they'd hoped that the thing would stay intact. You know, I think that some players and their parents are really um, alarmed or offended by what Connie had said, the anti-Semitic comments, um, and it was, it went beyond that. I mean, it wasn't just anti-Semitic comments, all sorts of offensive stuff. And, uh, but I think, I think the hope was they would play, you know, maybe they were offended, but, um, they'd already committed to the school. You know, some people might find it offensive. How can you stay and participate in a program where the owner of a school, Kanye West is, um, it wasn't a comment. It was almost like an ongoing uh stream of comments or um i mean he, he's been making these making these remarks for for months i think so it was hard to distance yourself from that or pretend it wasn't happening but because they'd made the commitment in terms of getting across the country and and finding a school to, I, I mean i think you know it's not easy to uproot yourself in the middle of the school year and find another place to play unless you're the five-star kid but you know for three-star or two-star you know good luck or it's a lot more difficult um, so, and I'm not saying they weren't offended either, but sort of got caught in a difficult situation there. Um, and what I found is some had already left, um, some of the players who were reserves and backups and maybe weren't entirely thrilled about the situation to begin with. But the bigger problem was, as we talked about, you, you alluded to is, these national prestigious um, high school tournaments disinvited them. And, you know, it was dominoes. It was one and then the other. And I think that, you know, once I think it started, no one wants to be the one who appears to um, support you know, the school. It's associated with someone who has you know, anti-Semitic beliefs and some would say even racist beliefs. Um, that he's that he feels compelled to share uh, nationally, internationally, and so yeah. Ultimately, it was just people feeling like I this is toxic. You know, I I can't be a part of this. We can't be a part of this. This is toxic. And in the end, it was it was nuts. Apparently, they were down to four players. I know they were down to four players, and they were trying to recruit more to rebuild this team. So really? well, that's news to I don't me. Know, should we give them credit for? Should we give him credit for determination or was that total delusion? But, you know, the fact they wouldn't give up on it um, either means there was, you know, significant financial incentive to get this team on the floor or they believed in giving these kids a chance to play. Um, but, of course, you know, Kanye was nowhere to be found or seen. And I think he was he was present a fair amount during the, uh, the previous year with the team. Practices, games, courtside. But uh, maybe we should have been shocked. It, I, I had no luck tracking him down. I did find him at the Super Bowl the year before. Right, but right. That was too early. You should have gotten his cell phone number at that time. Exactly. But here's here, here's some things about Don that I learned after our conversation is that you know they were paying between two to three hundred thousand dollars trying to find a coach for that job. So I, I know no other program in America that would pay that much to coach high school and. Um, I also found out that say you are coaching this team and I'm not speaking on Darrell Wright's behalf and I'm just talking hypothetically here. Like if you did were coaching the team and had a plan, Kanye would come in and just start giving orders 
that might not line up to your vision or what you've already planned or set up. And it would just cause chaos, confusion, and difficulties. So take away the anti-Semitic comments and the racist comments. He still was pretty difficult to work for. But Josh, he with the resources he had, with his mom being an educator and even naming the place after his mom, he could have made this into just a, a beautiful place, right? He could have done some outside the box education and still been, you know, gotten his kids qualified to play in the NCAA. He could have played in all these major tournaments and got great kids um, with a lot of talent. So he had the potential to do it the right way because finances weren't an option, right? But it was just too bad that, you know, it, it just it it couldn't have become more, right? And I'm not a big fan of basketball academies in general, but some are good out there, and this one just had the potential, and that's what's that to me I find the most frustrating. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, of course, he had the resources, and it was an interesting curriculum plan too. Um, you know, some things that were a little bit quirky about it, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that his yeah his mom was definitely uh, seasoned and did things maybe a little bit different, but. I appreciated what he's trying to get done, but just the the instability there. I mean, yeah. you know, you have the resources, but there was such instability with him personally, and I think that 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 uh, spilled over to the uh, the school itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, what he what he would have been able to do with the basketball program and facilities and so forth. Um, I'm not sure what happened when he walked into the gym, but I guess. If he thought he was capable of running the country, being president, he probably thought he was capable of being a high school basketball coach. I know, right? Right. And he's funding it too. So, like, you kind of got to listen to him, right? right. Um, so, <laughs> there's your own. <laughs> and maybe that was the thing, like, I can't afford an NBA team, but let me start with this. Yeah. And this is my team. Um, I don't know. Anyway, every, all those kids ended up transferring other places. They'll be fine. They're all pretty talented. So, it's just, uh, and what a great story. Hey, I played at Donda Academy for the year and a half it was open, you know? Uh, <laughs> right, right. That's, you know, there aren't too many people going to be able to put that on their resume. Yeah, and Josh, there's your story there. There's your there's your takedown. Um, hey, let's follow these guys up and be like, hey, how was your experience? You know, talk to me. Compare that to where you ended up, and there's a good pitch for you. That's a great story. The where, the where are they now story, including Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> exactly how much it would take to track him down but really it's a great story and find out how that impacted them and that's that was a problem with was well, a problem but um you didn't have the ability to really uh assess what was going to happen as a result you know were there consequences for these kids did it compromise their ability to get scholarships um did it slow their development i mean you never really know but some of those kids went there as you know, really highly rated um, recruits. And within a year, their stock had dropped. And I wonder, you know, you know that, you know, these kids better than I do, but is that a case of um, a kid just not developing regardless of where he's going to play? You know, it would have happened in Indiana as well as it happened in Los Angeles or that the environment there was not conducive for his development, that there were too many people ahead of him and uh, he just, he didn't win the fight to get playing minutes that he need to develop. So I'm not, it'd be interesting. I, I agree. Like to check him out two, three, four years later, did they ever get to college? You know, were, were they in D2 rather than power five team they expected to uh, play for? Yeah. Did their experience with Donda plus COVID, which has really affected a lot of kids, mental, mental health. Like what's that combination? And yeah, in two to three years, like would they have been better served just staying where they were, were originally versus going to Donda. Look, these kids took a chance on going to a brand new academy run by Kanye, right? And I'm sure they promised them, but a lot of these basketball academies, a lot of colleges, a lot of agents promise things. You got to do due diligence and you have to take agency in your decisions too. So to me, there's, you know, it, it it's not fair. Basketball, high school basketball, college basketball, pro basketball, it's not fair, right? So I... I'm a little bit harder when it comes to this, Josh, is like you got to take your chances. And then, you know, if you don't get better and guys do pass you, work harder, spend more time, you know, watching film, listening to coaches versus being on your phone versus worrying about your followers and your NIL deals. So to me, uh, everyone has a chance to make their own choices. The problem is these kids don't always have the best mentors in their corner, right? And these mentors have no clue what they're doing. And I see that, 
you know, basketball is my main sport, but I feel like there's so much bad advice given in the sport, not just in transferring to high schools like Adonda, but you look at the transfer portal uh, in NCAA basketball, there are so many kids that are transferring and it's like, who's telling you to transfer? What experience do they have? What do they know that your college coach or other people might not know? And I just, I see so many bad decisions and it's just, who's giving the Who's giving the uh, the advice here? That's why mentors in in basketball and other sports that you can trust that have um, good backgrounds that could be an advocate they're so important. And today they're rarer than ever, right? So that's a great. There's a great book out there too. I can't remember what the name of it is. Uh, it's about all the kids that went straight from high school to the NBA that didn't make it. We all know Kobe, LeBron, Kevin Garnett, but there's also Robert Swift. There's Leon Smith. There is um, Corleone Young, and there's more and more and more. And this reporter went and did a book and did a chapter on each player who got bad advice, got drafted somewhere, and then no one ever even remembers their name and where they ended up. And that's a great cautionary tale, too, that just because you might be go straight to the league doesn't mean it's going to be all you know, sunshine and roses, too. So it's just right. fascinating. Right. And, and to back up a little bit, and that's a great point, back up a little bit, when it comes to Don Day and some of the parents were – you know, understandably upset with what had happened, but other people said, how could you not have known? You know, your kid never went to school and uh, never visited school after he got there. Um, how could you not have known? I mean, all your classes were online. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it, but how could you not have known? This would be a possibility. So mentors, parents, and you know, maybe the kids can't be held responsible, but you know, they're going there to play basketball and not necessarily sort of get an education. It doesn't mean you can't do both, but it's like, come on, how shocked really should he have been if this thing unraveled? I know. And Josh, some kids don't want to do school. Like, so this online option for them is great. Play all day, stay in a group house, just barely, barely do any work. That's what some kids want. It might bite them in the butt in the future when basketball is over, but that's the choice they're making. I mean, it's not it's right. not like China where you're saying you're going to play basketball in this league. So I'm all for it. It's free choice, but you got to know that this sport's not going to last forever, right? Right. And you are forfeiting this other experience you have at a traditional school. It just are. So, and again, when some people had a hard time with parents crying foul, um, knowing that I'd probably – you know, mature enough or aware enough to get what the risks are. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a, a step back from Donda. And if what's your favorite sport to cover? Um, is that like choosing know, among your children? Uh, what's that? I said, is that like choosing your favorite child? Oh, that's funny. Um, you know, I enjoy anything that's that's riveting. I mean, be in the middle of a contest that's, I don't know, tiddlywinks and is coming down to the wire and, you know, fans are screaming and hollering and, and a lot's at stake. I know it's not tiddlywinks, but um, you know, boxing, oh, you know, now that we know so much that we do about concussions, it's probably not, um, certainly not the safest sport, but a great Boxing match, electric match, you know, heavyweights. Oh, I mean, that's that's an amazing event to uh, to be at. Um, you know, not necessarily football. I think football is a, a much better television sport than it is to sit in a press box and watch it. I'm grateful for a chance to sit in the press box. I'm grateful for a chance to get in the locker room and so forth. But, you know, I think basketball, when you're down close and uh, there's – you can really, I don't know, feel the energy more, you know, college and NBA, um, but a great horse race. I mean, it really can be anything that's just electric, that's uh, coming down to the wire, um, that involves a great story. So, but there is something about, yeah, the fisticuffs. There's something about the sweet science. Interesting. And, and boxing, like, if there was ever a good heavyweight to come out again, they would be, it, it would be unbelievable the attention they would get. If we had another Tyson come out nowadays, that would be unbelievable. But are those type of folks now going to the MMA route versus boxing? That's a good question. Um, there certainly are fewer. I mean, what Tyson Fury um, was a tremendous boxer, unorthodox, 
Uh, Deontay Wilder, probably the hardest puncher, maybe, you know, arguably the hardest puncher in the history of boxing. Um, I mean, a tremendous boxers, but actually, I really, I think Tyson Fury is a tremendous boxer, <laughs> but definitely competing. And I don't know, I don't know enough about the two sports to know that, wow, this MMA fighter would have made a phenomenal middleweight if you trained as a boxer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, but I got to think you're right that some of the talent is being siphoned into uh, mixed martial arts. And it's crazy to think it's actually safer. I think when it comes to concussions, I think they've established that boxing is the most dangerous, but um, maybe getting to the point where it's more lucrative. Um, I mean, you know, Dana White, they got a pretty good cap on salaries over there, but boy, boxing in the audience is, is, is shriveled. So unless you're at the top, you're, unless you're at the top of the division, I'm not sure how much money is available there. Um, but yeah, I miss, I don't know about you, but growing up, I mean, for me as the middleweights, it was, uh, you two, you're much younger than I am, but um, Sugar Ray Leonard and uh, mm -hmm. Roberto Duran, Marvin Hagler. Um, and uh, I do miss that. I do miss those, uh, those names or uh, tremendous fighters for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but what's been your most clicked on or read or or premier article that you've written in your career? Um, I wrote a story uh, about what what happened that we called it. Um, forgive me, it's not be appropriate for your viewers, but uh, the headline was Nipplegate. Whatever happened at Nipplegate? It was about the Janet ja the Jan Jackson, Justin Timberlake. Um, wardrobe malfunction where you know her top uh, briefly falls off and um i can't remember the, the i can't remember what the anniversary was but i went back and tracked down as many people as i could found who were involved in it and this was in minneapolis i can't remember how many years ago the super bowl at least five years ago my editor would tell me you know every month you know, another 30,000, another, another 20,000. It just had, the story had legs for whatever reason, but it was probably the one, I don't know what the, I don't know what the total numbers were, but um, it was among those that did the best. Also, after uh, Mike Tyson's return to the ring when he fought that exhibition, um, he said this press conference afterward that he had, smoked uh marijuana before the fight and that one did awfully well too so thanks mike for a million patriots <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> that's awesome thanks for sharing that um if any of our uh, listeners in the audience want to get into sports journalism um what's the prescription you'd give them um well if you're young and you're in high school i mean join our high school newspaper um, it's the best place to start and even in college it doesn't matter if you're majoring in journalism or not if you can write um, I'm sure they love to have you. So you just, you have to write, you have to have clips. There's some people who talk to me and said, well, this is a blog I have. And, um, here's some stuff I've written that hasn't been published and, uh, you need to be published. It doesn't have to be a huge, um, outlet, but it has to be published either online or a hard copy, um, and working with people who write as well, just to be mentored and, um, to have a good editor, you know, what you do right, what can you do better? But working with people who have those those skills too, that's what I would recommend. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. We're going to finish up here with some quick hitters, all right? Uh -oh. that, this is going to be a tough one here. This might be you oh. choosing among a lot of children and grandchildren, but what's the best sporting event you've ever attended live that this was the most memorable? Mm. The best sporting event I ever attended live. Like either famous, like a Christian wow. Leitner shot, you know or what? Kirk Gibson. Well, this is going to be this is going to disappoint a lot of people. <clears throat> um, the best event I attended live recently was uh, Inglewood High School's um, football team last year, and they had been like the bad news bears of high school football, and this like incredible, like heartwarming story about how this coach came in and revitalized things and. And I was sitting in the stands um, with someone I brought along, and 
Englewood had fall, fallen behind. It looked like the bad news bears all over again. And it was the most inspiring comeback. And, you know, the parents and the fans and yelling at each other and yelling at the players and then yelling in, you know, exultation. I know it should be the Super Bowl or the Olympics, but it was really riveting stuff. And that goes back to what I was saying, saying before, and I truly mean it, was some of the high school sports and games I've been to were as exciting as some of the pro stuff. Um, it was really, I mean, it matters as much to these kids as it does to, you know, Matthew Stafford and Michael Jordan. And I'm not saying that stuff isn't unbelievable too, but I was just really, yeah, I was, I was really lifted by it and, um, had so much fun. Also, I brought a friend along. So just to experience it with someone else, which you would do in the press box with your, you know, your colleague, but that was a great one. That's great. Is there an event out there, sporting event around the world you've not been to yet that you want to attend? Um, I don't think it's, it's yeah, Dead Rod. I think is that is he pronounced it? Yeah. Um, you know what? If I could get the right jacket, if I get the right jacket, winter coat, I might do it. I mean, I think that's unbelievable I, I would like to write a story about it you know i don't i don't think it would click much but that maybe wimbledon you know i haven't done any of the major yeah the grand slams for tennis um i think it'd be thrilled to do wimbledon i've done tennis but not any of the four uh grand slams so yeah i would i would be yeah i'd be elated to do something like that you need an Iditarod contact. I've actually got one. So just let me know offline about that. Maybe I'll race in it. Maybe it's a first person story. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> With greyhounds or some different dog than a husky. <laughs> <laughs> just give them heated sweaters and booties. Yeah, right, just bring my retreat. There you go. Yeah. Uh, what's the best concert you've ever seen? Oh, it's got to be my first concert, Human League. <laughs> wow. Great. Don't you great. want me, baby? Great band. Great band. Yeah. Okay, where was that? Where did that take place? In LA? It was in Los Angeles. I can't remember the venue, but it was my first. And uh, I wore some ridiculous 80s outfit. Um, and Adam and the Ants was another one. So a close second. Great concert. <laughs> awesome. Of course, your... we later later performed as Adam Ant. Yeah, yeah. What's your favorite movie of all time? E.T. E.T. I was going to assume All the President's Men because it seems like every journalist loves that movie. I love it. Well, it's a great story. It's a wonderful movie, but uh, E.T. E. captured my heart. Love um, it. Yeah. What's uh, your dream interview? If you could interview anybody out there you haven't yet, who would you choose? Mm. This would be a living person, right? I guess it would be hard to... to let's uh, do a living. Body. Yeah, let's do a living. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be sports. Nope. Anyone. Wow. You know what? I, I'd love to, I'd love to, to, uh, interview, um, Barack Obama. And you know what? Certainly can talk basketball. And I know he's played, uh, golf with Steph Curry. So wouldn't necessarily exclude sports. But um, you know what a fascinating man. Yeah, one of my one of the guys going to be on the podcast before you is named Ramon Penny, and uh, he was here at the house a few days ago. Good friend of mine from D.C., and he was in that small circle that used to play with Obama at the White House at oh closed off gyms. So he talks a little bit about oh uh, walking in the you know getting calls from the White House saying, "Hey, be here at six thirty, stat," no. and him walking in, and Kobe Bryant will be there one day or KD. Just come on. And everyone around them was like former college players. So yeah, it's uh that was pretty neat. That is phenomenal. In fact, the first time I went my, my girlfriend lived in DC, right? Uh now my wife. And I the first time I went to visit her, she goes, Bring some basketball shoes. Like, I'm gonna hook you up with this guy and you might play with Obama at six in the morning on a Saturday. And I hadn't played basketball in three years. So I'm going to the store getting shoes. Um, and I get there early, not knowing if I gotta go through security or this and that, but he didn't show up, but everyone there was like a former pro. And not playing in three years just just got my ass kicked. And I was like, welcome to <laughs> welcome to DC. And then I ended up moving there a few years later and 
you know, becoming friends with some of these guys, but, uh, really, yeah, I was trying to get, trying to get in that Obama circle. Cause that'd have been fun for the old, uh, telling the old grandkids I played ball with him, but oh my goodness, yeah. didn't happen. That was phenomenal. But, um, all right. Last thing here. Um, uh, what's no, yeah. What's next for you? Like, are you working on a story now that, uh, is excites you? Do you have anything in the hopper or is that stuff you keep close to the vest? Well, I am working on something. It's a little unique or unusual. Um, as I'm sure you know, there was uh, a volleyball match at BYU in, in August uh, that involved um, Duke, and uh, Duke had one um, black starter in its lineup. And after the match, actually during the match and after the match, she said that she and her black teammates had been racially heckled um, and became a huge controversy. And within two weeks of that match, um, there was a uh, back to school pride night for LGBTQ students. And they had been subjected to um, anti-gay slurs. And so I looked at, we explored during the volleyball match, what it was like to be a black athlete at BYU, what were some of the, uh, was environment like and some of the incidents, were there other incidents that had taken place? And so we decided, well, you know, there's another marginalized community here. And what's the tie in here? Is there overlap? And so I ended up talking to students, um, athletes who identify as members of um, LGBTQ community and some of the challenges they faced and, uh, you know, the overlap. Um, it's something I haven't done before, and um, I found it interesting and was, you know, really grateful for athletes to open up about something that's sensitive. Um, so I'm finishing that up, and uh, that's what I'm working on. That sounds fun. A uh, fun top, fun to research. Not a great topic, but uh, right, so, right. Got some interesting stuff you're doing there, Josh. Yeah. So anyway, thanks for asking. Yeah, so where can people find you if they want to read your articles or follow your uh, your latest updates? Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Well, you can find me on Twitter, and uh, I'm so um, I'm so non Twitter uh, savvy. I can't even tell you my my Twitter handle right now. Um, or you know what? You can email me at j peter j p e t e r at usa today dot com. Um, but, uh, Hey, Google will direct you to me. They're pretty good about that. Josh, Peter, USA today. And, uh, you'll find some of my work. Perfect. Well, Josh, thanks so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Uh, you shared some good Intel and behind the scenes on sports journalism that I know I never knew. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners will, uh, will find out more uh, about after listening to this. So thank you very much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun to, to visit with you here. All right. If you guys like this podcast and others, please be sure to subscribe at YouTube. You can find me on all the major podcasting platforms. There's topics like this and other great ones to include Navy SEALs, prep school coaches, uh, New York Times photographer, and, and more and more fun stuff's coming. So if you need to find me, go to prepathletics.com and always reach out to me. I'll talk to anybody and answer any questions about the prep school world you may have. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Take care.